Hey guys, how we doing? Alrighty, let's jump back in. Um, again, I'll do different things with, with the lectures. What I'm doing here is sort of going to be following what you're learning in the textbook, but kind of giving it to you in a, in a slightly different way uh, and, and stressing certain things that I don't think the textbook stresses as, as well as I would. Um, again, I want you to kind of have the sense of how, how amazing we all are and, and the cool stuff that our perceptual systems in this case are able to do. And so I've called this lecture transduction because I think that's where the magic really lies. So as you'll see, this term transduction refers to the step in the process where energy from the external world gets turned into a neural impulse that the internal world can now share and process and deal with. Uh, so I'm, you know, a, a very major kind of change in the signal, and this happens within every sensory system. Um, various kinds of energy, like sound energy or heat energy, uh, touches some part of our sensory system, and that part transduces that external energy into an internal neural impulse, uh, and that's you know how our bodies and therefore our brains are able to know what's going on out there. Um, so that's what we're going to talk about as we go through. We're going to stick mostly with vision. I'm going to start by just talking a little more about sensation versus perception so we can be very clear on you know, where we are um, and, and what parts of that overall process we're talking about. Okay, so let's start here. Um, those of you in office hours will recognize this, but uh, this is something called the Necker Cube. And it's, it's been a fascination to, to psychologists um, for a long time and to artists as well, because it's got a very interesting attribute. Some of you may already be experiencing it. When you look at that Necker Cube, does it flip around on you? Can you see it one way and then you suddenly see it another way and then you suddenly see it etc back and forth um, it, it does that for me because I know I've experienced this before uh, and it will for you in the future but let me walk you there for those of you who, who aren't seeing it right away so let's look at these two and let's focus on the middle one first what I want you to do with this cube and in fact with both of them but let's do it with this one first is you see the plane here that's in blue shaded in blue what I want you to do with your mind is is pull that towards you. Make this the front facing uh, side of the cube, the side that's closest to you. And if you do that, what you should see is then this would be the upper right hand corner of that front face and the cube would um, recede sort of up and back to the right. Okay, up and back to the right like this. Um, now come over to this one. Do the same thing. I want you to see this blue this blue plane now is the front of the plane, closest to you. And when you get that, this will be the lower right corner of that plane, and the cube will recede downward and to the left. It'll kind of go that way. So in the first one, it kind of goes this way, and the second one, it kind of goes that way. Um, can you see both of those? Hopefully. Um, you know, one at a time, just pull that blue towards you. And now, let me cover that up. And now let's look back at this and essentially do the same thing. You know, uh, you know what those two planes are now. Grab one, pull it forward. Grab the other one, pull it forward. What you should be able to experience in your mind is that this cube is bouncing around and flipping um, on you. Okay, what's the point of that? The point is the actual stimulation in the environment is not changing. Okay, it is the same black on the same white. There is nothing going on on the screen. All of that change that's going on is in your mind. So that's what you're perceiving. What you're sensing is staying the same. What you're perceiving is changing. And that's because perception is not just the input and processing of input. Well, it is, well, it is but that processing of input is critical because that processing includes um, memory and experience and other things. Remember everything we talked about about making sense of, of stimuli. Uh, the brain does, as soon as things start to impinge on our senses, the brain immediately tries to figure out what that thing is by comparing it to the past. And in situations like this, that processing can, can be variable. And because it's so ambiguous in this shape, you can see it two different ways and your brain flips between those two different ways of seeing what's out there. Uh, and so pretty, it, it provides a pretty you know, clear uh, demonstration that there's more to perception than just the raw processing of input. 
Okay, so let's talk about this distinction a little bit more here. Um, imagine we have information coming from the outside world. And again, this is the critical thing. And this information is usually some form of physical energy, you know, waves of light, waves of sound, uh, particles of light as well. Um, just literally the, the heat, the degree to which molecules are, are dancing around in the outside of the world. You know, there's all this energy out there. And that's really what the external world is. Um, you know, as the textbook talks about, for example, you're going to get your head messed up a little bit because things like color, there is no color in the real world. Not really. Um, it's just that light hits things and those things absorb some of the wavelengths of light and reflect other wavelengths of light. And our brain receives some of that reflected light and depending on the wavelength ends up seeing it as a certain color in our brain. It's not a color in the external world. There are no colors in the external world. So when you start, you know, thinking things like that, you're like, oh my goodness, our brain creates color. Yes, our brain creates color. And the other thing that I'll show you in a moment is, in fact, most of the external world we do not sense at all. There's way more out there than we even sense. So let's hold on to that. I'll come back to that point. Uh, but what is out there, we have certain receptors and that they allow us to to pick up um, certain kinds of energy. And what do I mean by pick up? Well, I mean transduce. That, that literally our receptors are set up to sense certain kinds of energy that are out there. And if that energy strikes them, then they are capable of translating that physical energy into a neural impulse. And that's the point where it literally goes from being in the external world to into our bodies uh, and ultimately into our brains and processed, etc. Okay, kind of a, a really cool process and, and we're going to focus on, on that process uh, quite a bit. Now, of course, ultimately, this information goes to a specific part of our brain, right? Depending on, on the kind of information it is, we're going to be focusing a lot on vision. So we'll talk about uh, the occipital lobes in this one as we go through. Um, the ultimate goal of all this, by the way, is to recognize what you're seeing. Uh, so, for example, if we look at this thing on the right, um, you know, these are really just patterns of light, right, that are there. But we've seen those patterns of light. We've seen that sort of shape. Um, we've seen those sorts of combinations of colors. And so when we start to sense this is what's coming in, uh, our brain can quickly recognize that. And what we perceive is fireworks. In fact, we can almost perceive what was happening just before this picture and just after, because we kind of know this is a snapshot of, of a of a event that has various temporal dynamics, you know, it changes over time. And once we recognize that these are fireworks, we can kind of imagine what, how this would play out, right? Also, some of you may recognize where this firework show is happening. Um, for example, if you look at this part of the picture, does that mean anything to you? Well, that probably depends. Have you ever been to Niagara Falls? If you've been to Niagara Falls, then you've seen the falls lit up at night. And that's what they look like when they're lit up at night. And so it's possible that depending on, on you, your brain picked that up and oh, you may have even recognized some of these buildings over here. And you suddenly recognize this as fireworks over Niagara Falls. In fact, the really important thing about all of this, or one important thing, is this is what we see, right? We see this as fireworks over Niagara Falls. We almost lose all the raw sensory information, all the you know specifics. It, it, once it's categorized, that's what we just kind of see it as: fireworks over Niagara Falls. Um, and and you know that system happens so quickly when we look around the world that we sense, we we have all these other processes that recognize what we're looking at, and then we just see things in space. And we're going to talk about you know, how we know where they are uh, in a little bit. Uh, but yeah, that's all we see. Very cool. So let's pull this apart, get under the hood a little bit. Um, so the so one of the things, yes, I, you know, you, you know, some of my views about animals um, and uh, human versus animal kinds of things. Uh, and 
You know, one of the, my beliefs is that we humans think pretty highly of ourselves. Uh, we, we first thought we were the center of the universe. Our planter plan, planet was the center of the universe. We had to learn that, no, okay, we're just on another planet in a solar system. Okay, maybe we're not that important. Also, though, when we think of ourselves as, as a life form on this planet, we tend to think we are the best life form on this planet. Um, and I think a little humility can go a long way sometimes. So one of the things that I talk about, first of all, is, you know, we have certain senses. There are things we can sense, but there are whole classes of things that we can't do that other animals can do sensory wise. So bats can use echolocation. They can use sound and, and somehow read the reflection of that sound to know where things are. Uh, sharks have these little minute electrical um, that they're called the ampules of Lorenzari under their snout. And they can sense electrical activity. Remember, we are all electrochemical machines. And for a shark, if there's a, a prey animal moving somewhere, that body movement causes an electrical field. And the sharks can sense it. Uh, they, they can basically tell where living beings are by the electrical currents those, those beings emit. Uh, Wow, that's kind of cool. Wish we could do that. We can't. Uh, rattlesnakes can sense low frequency vibrations that we just can't. Dogs have an amazing smell. They can smell cancer, literally, and, and are used sometimes now to detect cancer in people because they can do better than, than even machines we have to do that kind of thing. So, you know, first thing is to realize, hey, there's a bunch of stuff out there we can't even detect. And even the stuff we can detect, even our primary sensory um, approach, which is vision. If we look at vision, vision is just an ability to pick up wavelengths of light. And these wavelengths of light that are out there range from the extremely small, so-called cosmic rays up to gamma rays, to the extremely large wavelength um, waves, like broadcast band, even radio is a very large wavelength ray, uh, wave. And so these are all out there. We don't see radio. You go, oh, there's a radio signal floating around out there. In fact, these are the wavelengths of light we pick up, this tiny little portion of everything that's out there. It's this tiny little portion our eyes are sensitive to. A small little band that's roughly between 400 nanometers and 700 nanometers. This is the Roy G. Biv, right? Red, orange, green, blue, indigo, violet. Um, the, the light spectrum that we can pick up. Um, notice, by the way, I mean, just to, to make this hopefully a little clearer, just outside our vision is the infrared. And if you think of things like infrared goggles that, that um, you know, you see in military shows and all that kind of stuff where people can put these goggles on and they can see like body heat uh, of people. How does that work? Well, basically, those goggles are able to take this wavelength that's out there and shorten it a little bit. So the goggles themselves can pick up that long wavelength and then they can shorten that wavelength, which basically drags it into the spot where we can see it. And that's why there tends to be a lot of reds, yellows, and oranges with those things, because this is where it can drag it into. And so it can pull the long wavelength to the point where it becomes something our eyes can detect. Okay, but normally we just wouldn't. We wouldn't see that. Um, so all this to say, there's a whole lot more out there, man. There's, there's, there's a ton of sounds we can't hear, light we can't see, um, and, and even things like electrical currents and all this other kind of stuff um, that, that we just can't pick up. So, you know, it's humbling to think that, well, the brain is living in this environment, this world, and really it can only detect a little bit of what's out there, uh, and, and that's what it works with. Uh, and every animal is the same. They pick up different parts of this, but they, that's what they work with. Uh, cool. Okay. So let's kind of jump into the vision part as we go through this. Um, and, you know, it starts by just a little bit of anatomy, really, just to kind of understand things. So we've got pictures here where we can look at the eye both ways. And let's just, you know, make sure we get some of these terms here. So the iris is the colored part of your eye right here. Now, I've always said it this way, that it's the muscle that controls the size of the pupil, um, that it expands or contracts. The textbook says it's uh, that, that the muscle is 
connected to the iris or underneath the iris and the iris doesn't actually do anything. Uh, I don't know. Okay, maybe the textbook's right. But generally, you know, in this area where your iris is, where the color is, that's where the muscle is that can control how much light gets into the eye. So your pupil, pupil is the black part that's the opening that lets the eye in um, that can open up or close down now when I when I taught in the old school classroom I would literally you see my little lights out here I would do this little jokey thing where I would ask students to look deeply into the eyes of the person beside you uh, and then I would turn the lights out well, first I would turn the lights out for a little bit so it would be very dark in the room. And then I would say, okay, look into the eyes of the person beside you. Uh, and then I would flip the light on. And of course, that's that feeling we all get where it's like, oh, wow, why is it like that? Well, when the light goes out, your pupils dilate. They get wide to try to let more light in so you can see more in this dim situation. And then when you flip the lights on full, all this light is going in. And you can literally watch somebody's pupil just go shrink up. Um, as, as we react to that light. So you can still do that with uh, somebody in your household or something. Turn the lights out, let their eye adjust, and then look right into their eye and flip the bright lights on. Um, they will wince, they will whatever, but ask them to keep their eyelids open and you can watch the pupil kind of shrink down. You can do it to yourself in a mirror too, if, if you want to. Okay, uh, and so that's a critical role. Uh, that's the way the eye controls the intensity of the light that's coming in, and it allows it to adjust depending on bright versus less bright kind of days. Uh, the sclera is the white part of the eye. Uh, it's, it's literally, as it says, a tough my, uh, membrane that kind of gives shape to the eye as well as protection. So it's a stronger, thicker sort of material. Uh, the cornea, look, let's look down here now. The cornea is this sort of bulbous part in front of the eye that contains liquid, uh, and this provides a lot of moisture and nutrients to the eye in general, uh, the cornea does. Um, light, of course, comes in through the cornea and then through the pupil here, um, the, the hole of the pupil, and then hits this thing back here, which is the lens, okay? And so the lens um, literally focuses the light. The goal of the lens is to take depending on the distance that you're looking, to, to literally bend or not, which, which affects the way that light gets focused back here, which is the retina. And so literally by bending, it can bring the, the image you're looking at into focus if it really aligns it on the back of the, uh, the, back of the retina. And you know that's why you see when people's eyes are, are not, you know, when they're getting bad, when, when they're having trouble seeing at distances, you'll see them squint. What are they doing when they're squinting? They're bending that lens, and that allows them to, to change the focus of light on the back of their uh, retina. Um, and it's also often a sign that a person should maybe get glasses, which of course do the same thing, but you know, in front of the whole eye. So you don't have to keep squinting, you don't have to keep bending the lens. By the way, one of the reasons why we tend to need reading glasses when we age is that this lens dries out over time. It becomes less moist, less pliable, harder to make that squint thing work. And eventually we need some external way of doing what the lens does. Uh, and so we have external lenses. Very quickly now, um, aqueous humor is the, the fluid that nourishes the front of the eye, that's in here, and vitreous humor is inside the eye, so the eye is filled with a kind of liquid. You might sometimes feel like things are floating in your eye. They are. <laughs> we have stuff floating around inside of our eye, and sometimes the light hits that on the way to the retina, and we actually see those floaters. Uh, they are there. There's a system there to try to clean that out, um, but... Um, Every now and then they're floating around and that's just what happens. The retina is the surface the image lands on and it's the retina where the real magic of transduction is going to happen. Um, the inner coating of the retina is part that transmits the light signal focused or not into a neural signal. Very cool. Okay, um, I'm going to pause here for a moment. I will be right back. Alrighty. I don't know what that'll seem like to you. We'll see, but I, I had to pause for a bit. Uh, and this is the first time I've tried pausing a lecture and coming back to it. So here I am back to it. Excellent. Um, yeah, so I think we've talked about the eye. Uh, now let's actually get to dum da dum dum transduction. Um, so transduction, again, this is the magic. Uh, this is where uh, physical energy 
gets translated into neural energy. Uh, and this is really what every one of our sensory systems do. They're just all specialized in a different kind of physical energy. Um, so they're able to sense various things about the world and then turn that into a neural signal, which ultimately becomes how we perceive the world. But it's important to understand that our perception of the world um, is not the world. <laughs> we're not seeing the world as it is, as I mentioned before. Um, we, are, we are getting a version of something of what's out the world of of what's out there in the world um, and yeah and representing it in a way we think of as the world anyway let's do it let's talk about um, light and the idea is you know there's there's light coming in and it's hitting something in the world and now coming towards our let's say our eye um, over time and space and it's being integrated and it's leading to but uh, perception and behavior, whatever this 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 figure isn't all that important. Let's get into the actual story, of visual transduction. Okay, light comes in through the pupil, goes to the back of the retina. Now here's the weird, the first weird thing about the eye. When we talk about the back of the retina, this is sort of the back of the retina, sort of. In the following sense, the light will come in and it will pass through some layers of neurons without stimulating anything. So it'll pass by these guys, we're gonna call them the ganglion cells. It'll pass by these guys, we're gonna call them the bipolar cells. And it'll pass by these guys, which are the rods and cones, um, until it comes back here. Uh, and, and this part of the brain is really where the, the transduction starts. When it hits this part of the brain, it'll stimulate some of these rods and cones, and we'll talk about this in detail, which will then pass a signal to these bipolar cells, this bipolar layer, which will pass that signal to the ganglion cells, which will then um, send it out the optic nerve and, and send it along on its way to the brain. So this is just literally what's happening at the retinal layer. And the real interesting thing is we'll see that, yes, first it's transduction. We're going to change that um, light wave into a neural impulse. Uh, but these layers all have a job to do. And I hope by the end of this lecture, you'll get a sense of, of that job and what they're doing so that even by the time the signal leaves the eyeball, it's already been pre-processed um, to, to a large extent. So let's talk about that pre-processing and let's do each of these three layers, starting with the photoreceptors. Okay, so our, uh, our eyeball, uh, our retina, contains rods and cones. Um, and just to give you a sense of why they're called rods and cones, here's a rod. This is what that cell looks like. Um, here's a cone. Um, and that's what that cell looks like. And so remember, the light comes in here and stimulates back here um, this, this uh, pigment cell layer back here uh, and then might stimulate one of these. So first of all, let's talk about the rods. What stimulates the rods is just the brightness of the light. It's, it's the light itself. Nothing about the wavelength, just the intensity. The more intense the light is, the more likely it is to stimulate, um, well, the, the rods, I'm actually gonna, I'm actually gonna back that down a little bit now that I say that. Um, they're not responding to color, um, but in dim, because of this, in dim light situations, they're still able to pick up light. And so, have you ever been in a movie theater? Um, well, you have been in a movie theater. Uh, when you're in a dark light situation, especially if there's no exit lights or anything around, and if you look around, you'll notice you can see things, but everything's pretty much black and white. Um, the, all the colors are very much muted. That's what life looks like through your rods. The rods were made, in fact, for dim light conditions. They're really good when the lights are low, um, and they are what we rely on when the lights are low. They allow us to kind of pick up shades of gray uh, enough to, to be able to you know, move around our world and do things. Um, yeah, and, and that's that's one of the, the critical roles they play is, is helping us to get by when the light isn't very bright um, because the cones need brighter light um, and they are sensitive to color. 
because they are also in a higher concentration at the at the fovea of our pupil, which is where the light gets focused when we're looking at something, it ends up on our fovea. There's a lot of these cones there. And so they can give you a much more detailed image. So when you have enough light and you have these cones stimulated, that's when you can see a real clear and, and multicolored you know, sense of what it is you're looking at. So how does the transduction actually happen here? Um, it's, it's done via what we call a bleaching process. So light comes in and these are, this is the photopigment layer here. And these are cells that are sensitive um, to the light. And, and when light hits them, it causes a chemical reaction in them. Uh, chemical reactions are what the brain is all about, right? And so these chemical interactions that the light causes when it hits the photopigments um, can stimulate these rods and the cones. Um, the rods will be stimulated by almost anything that, that bleaches something, but cones, it will depend on the wavelength of the light that hits it. There are three different subvariants of cones. There are some that respond mostly to really red light. So let me say it this way. Light that has a, a long wavelength, that red kind of wavelength. Um, again, there's not really any color in the world. There's just light of different wavelengths. Uh, but there's other cones that will respond mostly to green and other that will respond mostly to blue, RGB kind of thing. And so these cones, if the light's high enough, if these things are being split, they get stimulated and, and now it is uh, an electrochemical process. You know, the pigments are actually what, what turns the, the energy into um, an electrochemical process. Uh, and so it kicks off that sort of neural response down the cones. Now, l let me kind of understand, you say, well, red, green, blue, but there's so many more colors in the world. How can you get all these colors out of red, green, blue? Well, I want to give you just a little sense. And this is actually backwards from how the eye does it. Um, but, but I think it's a good way to think about it. Let me just blow this up a bit. And let's take this little um, thing here. And let's say I want to play with the color inside here. So I'll go to the, the shape fill color. And I'm going to go to the more fill colors. Um, no, no, where do, where do I want to go? Here it is. This is where I want to go. Okay, RGB sliders. RGB, does that sound familiar? Red, green, blue. Um, yes, it... it Ruth Bader Ginsburg comes to mind too. That's RBG. This is RGB. Um, here's the notion that almost any color, so here's a color called black, right? And notice black is zero of all of those things. But if we now start adding some, some color to this, now look at this, what would you call that color? I don't know, some sort of almost bluish whatever. This is a color you get with 97 units of green and no red and no blue. If we added a bit of red to that, Let's add a lot of red to that. Now we're getting more to these sort of burnt orange or something kind of color, which you can almost imagine as, as a recipe of sorts. In fact, if we add a bit of blue to this, um, now we're getting this sort of color. Let's say we back off on the green. Now we get a richer version of this. Let's back off on the blue a little bit and suddenly it becomes you know more of a purplish kind of color. So what's the point here? If all of these could go from, say, 1 to 255, which is what they currently do. Let, let's say we, by the way, put them all up to 255. What do we have? White, right? So we have black if they're all 0, white if they're all 255. But for almost any color in the middle, we can express it as some mixture of red, green, and blue. And so that creates a certain color depending on how many units of those um, three you add. Okay, so I'm now talking about sort of mixing these three to create a certain color. But now let's just imagine that the eyeball is doing the opposite, that when we're looking at this color and it comes in, what these are showing is how likely the red cone is to be stimulated. And you see it's stimulated quite highly, 173. The greens, not so much. The blues, quite a bit. And so any color, if this color hits our retina, it is stimulating the red and the blue cones quite heavily and also stimulating the green somewhat. So if we actually ask, you know, how much does, does a given color cause these photoreceptors to split, depending on the color, 
it will differentially affect these photoreceptors. And the brain can now sort of take that information um, and, and sort of rebuild its perception of what the color of that thing is. And, and that's what the brain kind of does because again, there is no color. So really the brain here is just saying, oh, that, that wavelength of light that's coming in, you know, how much is it gonna split these ones and how much is it gonna uh, stimulate these ones and how much is it gonna stimulate these ones? Uh, and it gets this formula and then it recreates in the occipital lobe something that we perceive as this. Um, that's how it ends up being seen to us. So with those three values, you can get pretty much any color you want to get uh, under the sun. Um, let's try to get more of a, I don't know, what, what do you want, yellow color? We can get more into the yellows or even the oranges. You know, you, you can create anything by just the mix of those three. And so if you see that, then it's sort of the opposite that the eyeball is doing. Hope that made sense. There's a nice little pink one um, to think about there now. And so that is really, you know, what's come, going on. The wavelength is, is coming in, it's stimulating some rods and it's stimulating red, green, blue cones to varying extents. Um, and that information is now being passed along, passed along where? To the bipolar cells. So we know a little bit about the color that's out there. Um, and now the signal comes to the, the bipolar cells and the bipolar cells, the textbook talks about this quite a bit and it talks about small and large. Um, I'll let you get into all the details. I'm gonna stay at the higher level of what these things are doing. Um, and what they're doing is, it's a really clever center surround cell. And, and what they're doing is they're very sensitive to edges. They can detect when when the color changes. So for example, like here, it's not much of a challenge, right? You can see this circle really well. Um, you can see the edge that sort of defines that circle. But in the one up here, it's, it's a lot more tricky. Uh, and really what this layer of cells is doing is accentuating those edges. It's sharpening all the, the places where there's a change in, in, in intensity of the, of the light stimulus. And that's allowing us to have a crisper sense of what what that thing looks like you'll you'll have a real taste of this in just a moment i'll, I'll give you a sense of of um, what it would feel like to not have that sort of crisping of, of your edges happening um, but but that's literally um, what this layer does so we already have color coming from the cones and how they're stimulated now we're getting a sharpening of edges as it's processed through the bipolar cells and then it goes on to the ganglion cells um, which is kind of cool, which are kind of cool, A, just because of the kind of cells they are, um, and, and B, because it shows how sort of yellow comes back into the picture. How, how do we perceive yellow? So, uh, uh, because remember, it was red, green, blue, right? Cones. Um, and, and so where does sort of yellow come in at all? And it turns out that the brain kind of recreates yellow in, in a weird way. So let me first tell you about these cells, these opponent process cells that they sometimes call them. And I want to do it this way. Let's... Um, Let's get my, I'm sure I have a too busy uh, Chrome thing going on here somewhere. Yep, that's it, all right. Um, let's just do a metronome. There should be an online metronome, there we go. Uh, and so yeah, let's start at 100. One of these cells, let's say the red-green cell. There is a cell that's getting information from the layers below. And this cell is looking for red or green. And this is gonna be the cool thing. Okay, let me back up a little bit and make sure you get this cool thing. Most neurons, most nerve cells, the way they work is they sit there quietly unless something excites them. And if something excites them, then they send a signal. And so they go from quiet to sending a signal. And so they're, they're kind of detectors, you know, whatever they're looking for, when, when it's there, they're like, it's there, it's there, it's there. They, they send this sort of, um, well, you know, an action potential out to other nerve cells. Um, so usually most cells do nothing or they send a potential. And as I told you before, that potential could, could be inhibitory or excitatory. Um, these guys can send two different messages. So the red green will, will be telling the rest of the brain, um, whether there's a lot of red out there or whether there's a lot of green out there. In fact, it's going to kind of sharpen our ability to distinguish between red and green um, in this opponent process cell. And the way it does it is the following. 
when neither red nor green is out there, oh, can we not hear this? Um, it says it's working, and I'm not hearing anything. And my volume's up. Oh, shoot, that's not very good. Um, I'm confused. I'm really confused. Okay, I'll just have to be the metro. That's all. Not a problem. Let me stop this one. Um, strange though. So, so here we go. This cell, when there's neither red nor green, it goes at a certain rate. And so this is sort of its resting thing. It just does this. Now, if there's red present, then it speeds up. And it speeds up more if there's more red present. If green is present, then it slows down. And it becomes a much slower firing rate than normal. Now, once the green disappears, it goes back to its normal middle firing rate. However, as you'll see, it overshoots first. It overshoots and then comes back to the middle level. Um, so first of all, that's just cool. That's a nerve cell that can signal two different things um, by either slowing down its rate of firing or speeding up its rate of firing, which is kind of cool. Um, and so what this allows us to do, again, is sharpen red versus green. Are you thinking color blindness yet? You should. Uh, people with color blindness have problem with these ganglion cells, and they sometimes can't see the difference between red and green. They have trouble with that distinction. These cells allow us to, to it really separates. If it's more red than green, we're really going to notice that red. If it's more green than red, we're really going to notice the green. So it really doesn't allow, when both the red and green cones are stimulated, it really makes one of those colors more dominant for us and allows us to tell the two of those apart. It also does it with blue and yellow, which is really weird because you'll say, well, wait a minute, there was no yellow rod and you're right. And so the way this one works, it's the same idea, sort of. It has a middle rate of firing. When blue, when the blue rods send, or blue cones send information, it slows down. If the blue disappears, it goes back to its middle rate. When does it speed up? It speeds up when both red and green are present. When the code cones for both red and green are firing, are, are sending strong messages, then this one gets excited. Wow. So here's the sort of story of what happens. If something is yellow out in the environment, okay, this cut this produces a wavelength of light. I should show you what I'm showing you. I don't even know what I'm showing you. Anyway, this produces a wavelength of light that comes into your eye and you don't have a yellow um, cone. But it turns out that this color stimulates both your red and green ones. So I told you that they maximally respond to red, and that's true, but they also respond to yellow. And the green ones maximally res respond to green, but they also respond to yellow. And so when yellow is out there, it makes both the red and the green simultaneously active, which means it kind of cancels out on this side, right? But on this side, it excites this cell. Uh, and so by the time the, the, the information leaves these ganglion cells, um, we have these sharp edges and we have everything coded in terms of how much red or green there is and how much blue or yellow there is. Uh, and that information goes through onto the eye. Wow, crazy. Okay, let me, this all, this all sounds a little wild, I think, crazy. It does show you how these nerve cells can operate in many different ways. And in fact, the textbook will even tell you a slightly more complicated story. Um, so you'll get the sense that these nerve cells are, are complex little beings. But now I want to kind of go back here and think about this again, and then give you just a couple of demos to leave you with. So light comes in, stimulates rods or cones, which starts that color information going, hits the bipolar, which sharpens the edges of what you see, and then goes through this ganglion cell, and that's where sort of um, color sharpening happens as well, and the introduction of yellow into the system. So I want to show you this, and the way I'm going to show you this, let, let's let's first, let's kind of do two different th things at once. So I'm going to give you a little demo, but what I want you to keep in mind is, first of all, you're going to see an after image. So, so let me just start talking to you about it. Let's just start doing it. If, if you can, please, um, look right around here, right around the edge of the O and just stare right there 
with your eyes open. You can blink every now and then if you want, but just stare there and listen to me uh, as I talk and keep your eyes staring there. Okay, what I'm going to do in a second is I'm gonna move the slide on and it's gonna to go to a complete white slide, but you won't see a complete white slide. Uh, you will see an after image. Why? Well, you see everything that's green right now, it's making your bipolar cell um, signal green, which is that slowing down, right? It's slowing down that, that bipolar cell. But as soon as I make the green disappear, it'll try to go back to its average level of firing, but it, will, it won't be able to do it. It'll, it'll mess up and it'll overshoot. And so suddenly the stuff that you see as green right now, you'll see an after image for a while where it's red, reddish. Uh, and the stuff that you see as blue right now, the, the wording again, when we take that away, the cell will try to go to a medium level, but it will overshoot and it will signal the opposite. So when I take this away, what you'll see is something like, and so it's a little different every time on, for every, depending on the exact color mix I used, uh, but you will essentially see the yellow word stop on a red sign, okay. Just before I do that, keep looking right at that O, um, I want you to also pay attention to the following. Right now, look at how crisp the word stop is and how crisp the, the sort of octagon of the sign is. When you get that after image, you'll notice it's not so crisp. Why? Because the after image is coming from that third layer, the bipolar cells, and information from that third layer does not go through the ganglion cells, and therefore it is not sharpened. And so you're simultaneously going to feel right now your ganglion cells producing an after image, and you're gonna feel the lack of your bipolar cells because you'll see that it's not as sharp as this. That was a whole lot of talking. Let's do it and see if it works. Whoa, I got it. Now you can blink every now and then, and blinking kind of seems to re-strengthen the after image. I'm not quite sure why. Um, but I certainly have a pink stop sign with a yellowish looking something in the middle, but I can't even see it as the word, it's gone now. I can't even see it at all now. Um, which, which is because, right, the cells have gotten back to their average level of firing. Let me go back to here again and, and let's just do it once more together. Um, I couldn't even read the letter stop. I could see sort of lines and, and, and things like that in my after image, but it was extremely blurry, again, because it is not being processed by the bipolar cells. So that's what the world would look like if we didn't have that sort of sharpening step in there. And again, the fun thing of the after image is just, um, is just these uh, by, uh, ganglion cells. I always gotta get these right. Ganglion cells overshooting. That's why we get these after images. Let's do it once more. See if you can see the word stop. You know, I can't. I, I kind of have a yellow blob in the middle of the pink something, uh, but I can't see the word stop. Okay, so. There you go. I thought that little demo takes a lot of time to get there and explain to it, but it might really let you feel some of what you're reading about. And I think that's really cool. We're gonna end with this one. This is just one of my fun things. I love to do it in a class with 500 students in it, but we'll do it here. One more fun after image thing and focus right around these dots right here. This one I honestly say is a little puzzling. This, is, this was really well crafted in my opinion, because again, I'm going to do the same thing. We're gonna look I'm gonna to move to a, to a white slide and you'll see an after image. But in this case, what puzzles me a little bit, I mean, everything's sharp, I guess. When I look at this, I see sharp edges, but it feels to me like the after image is clearer than the actual image, um, that, that I see more detail in the after image. And I think that has a lot to do with memory, filling in details, because this is an image you know, and you know quite well. And so let's do it. Try blinking every now and then, there. Yeah, I have to blink to do it. When I blink, Jesus, it's Jesus. <laughs> I wasn't swearing, I was just recognizing. Um, th this is called the Jesus illusion. You can find it online. Um, it makes people go, whoa, I can see Jesus. Uh, when I couldn't see him a second ago, um, hey, that's why you come to psychology for, right? To see Jesus, there you go. Uh, a fun little illusion, uh, try it with your friends. Again, which cell layer produces that, uh, that effect? Cool. I'm going to leave it there. I will see you in the next lecture.